Good morning. Welcome. Good to have you here. Happy Monday. Oh, here we go again. No, seriously, fun to have you. Um, I, I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, this Friday at 1 o'clock, 1.10, uh, we'll, we'll talk about problem set number two, which has information over what I call chapter 14, part one, which is basically acids and bases separately, all right? And uh, quiz number two will follow. I will probably put a Le Chatelier's question, principal question on there, even though that was officially problem set one. I uh, want to talk about it. Um, You'll turn in the equilibrium constant lab, which we did on Friday. Uh, there is a typo in there. You don't have to type anything, so apologies for that. You will turn in a graph created on Excel or numbers or something like that, but nothing to type and stuff. And then we'll start the Le Chatelier's principal lab. And that's one of the reasons why I want to put a question on quiz two, because we'll do a lot with Le Chatelier's principal and how that works out. Um, you can check your grades online now. Uh, if you go to the website, there's a thing that says check your grades. If you can't find it, let me know and I'll email it to you. Um, when you check your grades, you'll put your MHCC ID number in and your grades will pop out. Now this is not part of Blackboard or WIPS or my MHCC or anything like that, but um, it is something you can do. I usually upgrade the, updo the grades uh, like Monday night, Tuesday morning, but this week I wanted to do it a little early just so I could take care of business. Questions, any of that? Cool. So we left off on Friday talking about Lewis acids and bases. And we did look at this slide, but I want to look at it one more time. A Lewis acid and Lewis base is different from a Bronsted acid and Bronsted base. So the Bronsted acid and base is what chemists use most of the time. Hydrogen donators are Bronsted acids. Hydrogen acceptors excuse me, our Bronsted bases, and that works really good. pH, all that kind of jazz. However, there is another type of acid-base theory which is really helpful, and it's Lewis acids and bases. Now, a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor, all right? And so you can have things be acidic, quote unquote, or basic that aren't a traditional Bronsted acid or base. They may or may not have a pH associated with them because if you have a pH, you have to have hydronium, all right? If you have hydronium, you can still do it. Um, Truthfully, Lewis acids and bases is a better theory than Bronsted acid bases. It's much more comprehensive and it allows us to talk about types of systems that uh, Bronsted acids and bases would. Um, one of the cool things that a Lewis acid base theory does, it, it explains why solutions, aqueous solutions of transition metals are acidic. So if I have like an iron plus three aqueous solution and I said, is it acidic or basic? Initially, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't probably just would say it was neutral because there's no H plus or hydroxides or anything like that. But what tends to happen is water has lone pairs on it. And so water like hydroxide, like ammonia is a potential Lewis base and it can pull a hydrogen off one of the waters, which naturally pushes themselves into transition metals. Transition metals are great Lewis acids. They usually have lots of empty orbitals and stuff for putting electron pairs. So when transition metals are in water, they naturally have between four and six of these waters around them. Copper is one of the ones that usually has four. But anyway, it, they're not held on super tightly. And so water can come up and actually extract one of the hydrogens. So in this picture, one of these hydrogens was taken from the water to make hydronium, all right? Hydroxide OH has a stronger attraction for the transition metal than water does. So there's a little bit of a benefit. Uh, but anyway, if you think about this, you've got some kind of compound reacting with water. It makes a conjugate base. All right, because we know that conjugates have one less hydrogen. So one of the waters became OH and it also creates hydronium. So this truly is a Ka expression, an equilibrium constant for a weak acid. Really, I should probably have a double sided arrow there, not just a single sided. But anyway, the important part and why I'm pushing it again is that if you have a solution of a transition metal in water, it's not neutral. All right, it would be a little bit acidic. They're not like hydrochloric acid acidic, but they are a little bit acidic. 
So we looked at this question earlier, but we'll, let's, uh, let's do it again. Here's an example. You've got a 0.1 molar iron 3 chloride solution in water, and what's the pH going to be? Well, chloride is the conjugate of a strong acid, HCl, and all of those, like sodium ions, bromide, nitrate, etc., they're not going to have any effect on pH. So if it was just chloride, we'd say it was pH 7. But crazy iron, one of the transition metals, the groups in the middle on the periodic table, that one is going to be a little bit acidic. So it'll be less than seven. And these kind of questions don't ask if it's, you know, super acidic or a little bit acidic. All you need to know is that transition metals do make a little bit of acid. So they will be like a little bit acidic. Questions on that? Okay, we also looked at this one. Some compounds are what they call amphoteric, which means they can be both an acid and a base. And those, uh, the group 3A twisted metals, as I call them, are great examples of that. Aluminum, as well as gallium, and boron sometimes too, will do this. So aluminum hydroxide, if you looked at the compound, anything with hydroxide is almost always a base. And that is something aluminum hydroxide can do. It can react with hydrogen ions to make aluminum and water. In this context, you would think of aluminum hydroxide as a Bronsted base, all right? The hydroxides are accepting the H plus to make water you end up with aluminum by itself. But aluminum, like we talked about on, uh, on Friday, is also a type of Lewis acid. All those group 3As and stuff, the twisted metals as I've been calling them, they never feel complete. They don't have the octet that we made such a big deal in Chem 222. And again, an octet is just four pairs around it. So all these group 3As will actually accept a lone pair under the right conditions into that empty orbital, and it gives them like a type of, a, of an octet that way. Uh, you'll see a lot of ions like this where the, cent where the group 3A metal has like four Lewis bases around it, often with a charge. So anyway, some of these can be both acid and base. They can't make up their in the presence of an acid, this will probably be a base. In the presence of a base, this will probably act as a Lewis acid. Um, here's some pictures showing what happens. Um, this is just aluminum plus three. You add a little bit of ammonia, and it makes aluminum hydroxide, which most hydroxides are pretty insoluble, so you'll see it right away. And then if you take the aluminum hydroxide and you add a really strong base, that's when all of a sudden this Lewis acid component activates. The hydroxide pushes itself into the aluminum. So this thing looks like it's clear. It's technically a complex ion, which is a Lewis acid, Lewis base uh, addict. This would be the ALOH4 minus one. And just as a quick kind of history flashback, uh, if you're making aluminum hydroxide, you know, oh yeah, add a lot of hydroxide, it'll make lots of this insoluble aluminum hydroxide, but you keep adding and it all disappears. This was like really freaking chemists out for a long time. Uh, and this happens more often than not. So these crazy complex ions will kick in sometimes, your precipitate will go, go away and you're like, what the, <laughs> all right. Uh, Welcome to the Lewis acid base world. Anyway, the same aluminum hydroxide solid you made earlier, if you add an acid to it, then you'll have the classic acid base reaction. Uh, water will be given off lots of energy. So in this context, aluminum hydroxide is a base, a Bronsted base. Here it's acting as a Lewis acid to create the complex ion A. Now, if you make a complex ion, all right, there's a type of equilibrium constant associated with it. And again, why this is important is because a lot of times chemists are like, well, if a little is good, a lot is better. And oftentimes that works, but oh, not with complex ions. So this is an example of an equilibrium constant for a complex ion and they're called formation constants. They sometimes get the symbol K sub F. So we've seen here Ka and Kb, equilibrium constants for acids and bases. 
this KF is a formation constant and it's for making these complex ions. Um, if you're going to have a formation constant, the complex ion is the product and whatever goes into it are the reactants. So in this context, notice there's a copper plus two, ammonia is neutral, and there's four of them, and it is an equilibrium. Uh, the difference between KFs and the Ks and KBs we've seen is that Ks and KBs are usually much less than one. Complex ion formation constants, huge numbers, usually much, much, much greater than one. And that just means that these want to form. So it's really easy to see this kind of dark blue solution form, this copper NH342 plus thing, because the Ks are so product favored, all right? If you put copper two plus in the presence of ammonia, bam, this is made. It is an equilibrium, so you do have some of these, but man, this K is so big that you have a dominance of this thing over the other ones. We will make complex ions in lab this week. Woohoo! I know you're excited, but anyway, uh, it's amazing how you just keep adding stuff and all of a sudden your stuff goes away and you're like, what the? Complex ions. This can be used for good though. It frustrated chemists for a long time, but here's actually a place that we use it in our lab. Um, in Chem 221, uh, the Veterans Day weekend. Uh, some of you did the unknown chloride lab, but some of you didn't because we had Veterans Day and all that jazz, all right? Well, in that lab, silver nitrate reacts with a chloride source to make silver chloride. And at the end of that lab, all of our glassware has a white film over it, all right? And you can like physically scrub it, but you'll miss some blah, blah, blah. So there is actually a chemical way that uh, we use here in the stock room sometimes to get rid of that silver chloride. Now, silver chloride it's really insoluble, all right? Like really, really hard to get rid of. However, if you add a little bit of base to it, you do make the complex ion, AgNH32+. And this is has a charge, so it's something that will dissolve in water and chloride, all right? So if you wanna get rid of that white film on your glassware, this is the equilibrium you're dealing with when it comes to AgCl. Now, we're gonna talk about a, this type of K, KSP, uh, in a future chapter. We haven't done it yet, but this is something we'll talk about. Uh, silver chloride is solid and the ions are products. This K is very, very reactant favorite. K is much less than one. So by looking at this reaction and looking at the value of K, because this is so much less than one, we would say it was reactant favorite. You're gonna have a lot of the solid sticking around. However, if you add some ammonia, the formation constant for making this complex ion kicks in. And if you look at this long enough, formation constants, you have the complex ion as a product, and whatever goes into it are your reactants. This is also pretty high. It's not as big as this is small, but it is pretty big, all right? So if you're curious, you can combine these two equations and the silver ions on both sides will cancel. So the silver chloride plus ammonia comes down, ending up with the complex ion and the chloride. So if you wanted to know the net K for this reaction, you would, like we saw when you combine equations, you multiply Ks together. So KSP times K formation, you end up with 2.9 times 10 to the minus three. Now this is still reactant favored, all right? Still dominates the silver chloride, but it's more product favored than this one was, all right? So in the lab, this is a pretty good way to get rid of ammonia. You add some ammonium and a lot of the silver chloride goes away. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And by Le Chatelet's principle, if you pull out the old silver stuff and add more ammonium, you keep forcing the reaction to go to the right side so you can keep getting rid of the silver chloride. You have less and less and stuff, so. Questions on that? All right. So in this chapter, all right, chapter 14, part one, the goal was kind of to discuss what happens when you have acids and bases separately, all right? So this is kind of an overview of some of the things we looked at. Uh, think about this stuff as we go along. 
Now, in chemistry, there are, of course, strong acids and bases as well as weak acids and bases. The strong acids, there's only five of them. If you have one of those five and you want to find the pH, it's literally minus log the concentration of the acid. So Jenna has some 0.1 molar HNO3 in her garage, and be careful if you do really have that. But anyway, if she wants to know the pH, it's literally minus log 0.1. Whatever concentration of strong acid that goes right there, you can find the pH right away. Strong acids are 100% dissociated. We can use the single arrow, not the equilibrium form. For bases, it's something similar. Now, 14 equals pH plus pOH. pOH of a strong base is minus log concentration of base. But chemists use pH almost all the time. So let's get rid of the middleman, pOH, and just make it a pH expression. So if you do that, strong base equals 14 plus log concentration of strong base. There's only three strong bases, lithium, sodium, potassium, hydroxide. Uh, Hayden has 0.5 molar KOH in his garage. I don't know why everybody has acids and bases in their garage, but I'm going to go there. Anyway, he wants to find the pH of it, no problem. 14 plus log 0.5, whatever that is, that would be the pH of his base, all right? Now, when it comes to weak acids and weak bases, though, we have to think about the equilibrium constants. You need a Ka or a Kb value because the hydronium depends not just on the concentration, like these up here, but also on the equilibrium constant. So starting basically now, all right, for more or less, as long as 100 times K is less than C, which 99.9% of the time is going to be the case, the pH of a weak acid minus log square root Ka times Ca, all right? You don't have to use a quadratic formula if 100 times K is less than C, which is most of the time the case. This will be something we'll use quite a bit coming up. And then likewise, there's a Kb expression for weak bases. If 100 times Kb is less than Cb, you can use 14 plus log square root Kb times Cb. So that incorporates the KB and the CB value. Now, all of these things stem from the fact that KW, 10 to the minus 14, is the value you're using. And in Chem 223, we're basically going to assume that we're always at 25 degrees Celsius, all right? But John starts doing stuff, uh, studies with the human body, which is more like 37 degrees Celsius. KW will change, and that might change some of these pieces up here, I'm letting you know. So if any of you do research on human beings or on Mars or Venus or something, some of these equations, you may have to tinker a little bit, all right? But in Chem 223, we're going to assume we're at room temperature, so KW is 1 times 10 to the minus 14th, and that equals hydronium times hydroxide. If you minus log everything in here like we did earlier, you get 14 equals pH plus pOH, and that's kind of cool. Now, if you have conjugates, a conjugate acid in its weak base or a weak acid in its conjugate base, Ka times Kb also equals Kw, which is pretty helpful. They must be conjugates, so you could do acetic acid and acetate, or ammonia and ammonium, but you wouldn't want to do ammonium and acetate, even though that's an acid and base, they're not conjugates of each other. So if you have conjugates, Ka times Kb also equals Kw. And in the next chapter, 14 equals pKa plus pKb will be helpful to us. So kind of foreshadowing there a little bit and stuff. Questions so far? Okay. Um, Equivalence point is the half wave, is when the moles of what you, the acid and the moles of base are equal to each other. Um, if you have a strong acid plus a strong base, they knock each other out, and your pH in theory should be equal to seven. So I make jokes about if you have HCl and sodium hydroxide and they're the right amount of moles, in theory you could drink it. It would be like salty water. I would never let any of you do it, but in theory it should be neutral, pH 7. Don't even think about it, John. I see you looking. No, I'm just joking, Kayla. I mean, whoever is thinking about it, don't even go there. I, I like you all too much and stuff, so no. 
It's a dumb joke. We'll tell you stories about Barlow basically later. Anyway, uh, if you have, though, a strong acid and a weak base, at equivalence, that weak base becomes its conjugate acid. So when the moles of those are equal, you're actually going to have a little bit of an acidic pH. And conversely, if you have a weak base and a strong acid, when the moles are equal, they knock each other out. But that weak base becomes an acid. So the conjugate will kick in at the equivalence point. All right. We will definitely talk about that more in the next section. And then finally, these last two down here are just about Lewis acids and Lewis bases. All right, they're a little bit funky, but they're not too bad. A formation constant is just whatever complex ion you're looking for in the products. And in the reactants, you'll put whatever goes into the complex ion. So we saw the example of the copper ammonia complex ion divided by copper and ammonia. These Ks are usually much greater than one. All right, Ks and KBs usually less than one, but KF will be bigger, better than, bigger than one. And finally, we'll talk about Lewis acids and bases more than they making these complex ions, but it's nice to know that Lewis acids just have a place for lone pairs, and the Lewis base has a lone pair to donate. So in the Lewis structures we did, anything with a lone pair potentially could be a Lewis base. The Lewis acids are usually transition metals as well as the group 3A twisted metals. So, any questions? All right, so that's it for this chapter. All right, um, chapter 14, part one, like I said, is mostly acids and bases by themselves. Now what we're going to do is think about what happens when acids and bases come together. Because, uh, you know, you find acids and bases in your garage, which is my theme apparently this morning, all right? Uh, you know, you don't really want acids and bases to like hang out usually unless you have a, a use for them or you know what you're doing, right? So a lot of times people will try and get rid of them. And the easiest way to get rid of an acid is with a base or a base with an acid. But you kind of got to know what you're doing because you have to make sure the moles are the same. You have to make sure you know the types of acids and bases and stuff. And so a lot of times a chemist then is called upon to have safe disposal of acids and bases and stuff like that. But there's other reasons too. Uh, in problem set two, you're going to see the last page is a big list of Ka and Kb values. And scientists had to determine that. Um, our lab last week was basically about finding the equilibrium constant for one lab. It's kind of involved, you know, you got to know initial concentrations, ice tables, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're going to see in this chapter that a titration, something like this, is a great way of finding a Ka or Kb value if you have a weak acid or a weak base. Now, a titration for an acid base uh, is usually something like this. What happens is you'll add slowly an amount of what's called the titrant. And the titrant is something you'll add from a burette. Uh, if you saw a burette in Chem 221, awesome. But if you didn't, don't worry, we'll use them in lab ourselves. Uh, burettes are just basically a long tube with a little stopcock thing at the bottom. And you can slowly add in the titrant, whatever you're doing, uh, to make it happen. Now, in an acid-base titration, the y-axis is usually going to be pH, and the x-axis will be the volume in milliliters of whatever you're adding. Now notice that at zero milliliters of titrant, we're starting with a pH just a little under three. Does that mean that what we're starting with is an acid or a base? acid. That's right. Anytime your pH is less than seven, you're going to have an acid. All right. pHs between two and four are often weak acids. Not all the time, but often they're weak acids. This one definitely is a weak acid, as we'll see later. As you slowly add the titrant, notice how the pH is getting bigger. All right. It's going up the scale. So in this case, we definitely are adding a base because bases will make your pH go up. Acids will make, of course, your pH go down. When you get used to reading these kind of what are called titration curves, the equivalence point, which is kind of the middle part of this narrow part, that's going to be really important to us coming up. 
when you're able to read one of these curves, you'll see that this pH is bigger than seven, all right? Seven would be right here on the scale, and you can see the middle point's probably about right there. That shows you, when you get used to this stuff, that yeah, you are definitely starting with an weak acid. So if you start with a pH two to four, probably weak acid, but you'll be able to tell by this point, the equivalence point, that you actually do have a weak acid. So there's a lot of neat information you can pull from a graph like that, and we're gonna start pulling it out and figuring out the kind of information you can get to. So get ready. Uh, at the end of this chapter, you'll be able to find the pH with any combination of acid and base coming together. And that's kind of cool. So you may not even be doing a titration. You may just mix some random acid with some random base. And using these techniques, you'll be able to find the pH, how much acid is there, and stuff like that. So, all right. This is an example of a titration setup, and we will do uh, a lab or two like this. Now, in this kind of setup, we've got a ring stand, all right, with some kind of clamp that'll hold this kind of narrow tube with a stopcock on it. And this is called a burette. A burette is just a way that we can slowly add in chemicals, all right, at a certain amount. Most burettes are good to a hundredth of a milliliter, so 0 0.01. And believe it or not, this is something where here at good old Mount Hood Community College, we are able to compete with MIT and Berkeley and Oxford and all these places because the burette allows it to happen. Got good sig figs, all that kind of jazz. So, woohoo, go Mount Hood. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so the burette has the titrant, what you're slowly adding in. And then down here in a beaker, or I prefer Erlenmeyer flasks, like right here, uh, you're gonna have what's called the titrate, all right, which is just whatever you're starting with, okay? And you're slowly adding it in. Now, because this is a pH system, you need what's called a pH meter, a pH probe. And that's just some kind of device that measures how much hydrogen ion you have in solution, all right? And again, this is something you'll do. So in this example, you're starting with some kind of known concentration. It's usually this stuff up here, all right? You know what you're adding. You not only know the chemical you're adding, but you also know the molarity of it, how strong it is. And you're slowly adding it to its opposite. So if this is a base, then you'd be slowly adding it to an acid, all right? Something where you've got some kind of reaction going on. The pH met, uh, meter will slowly tell you how acidic or how basic you are. And eventually you're gonna get to what's called the equivalence point. Equivalence point is just where the moles of what you're adding from the burette equal the moles of what you started with. So in this problem here, the moles of HCl would equal the moles of the NaOH at the equivalence point. And if you look at the titration curve, you'll be able to find that right away. It's like that narrow spot where it's relatively straight up and down. Uh, cool. <clears throat> so the goal of these kind of things, all right, is usually to determine uh, how concentrated maybe this stuff is down here in the beaker or the Erlenmeyer flask. You might wanna know its pH dependence. You can definitely find out how concentrated this stuff is in your beaker or Lindmeyer flask. You can also find the molar mass. Chemists are always interested in finding grams per molar in compound. And we'll see uh, that you can actually do that using a good titration, which is cool. So titrations are pretty powerful. <clears throat> this just shows, this is like initially what happens. This is like the middle point. And this is then from the middle point to the end. Now in all of these, we're starting with an acid. All right, so again, the starting point at zero milliliters of titrant is acidic, all right? And you can see what happens at first, it kind of makes like a little plateau. Then after a while, the plateau begins to rapidly increase. And then finally, you get past that point of increase until you get to kind of a more plateau again. 
Sometimes scientists refer to these as S curves. You have to use your imagination a little bit to see it. And the S curves, by the way, can be reversed too. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, they kind of look S like. <laughs> okay. Um, if you have a, uh, you're starting with an acid and you go to a base, it does look more like an S. Sometimes they're reverse S. Now, this example has a strong base in the burette the part right here, and you're adding that to a weak acid, acetic acid. So it starts off kind of pretty acidic, goes through this little kind of plateau region, then it goes through a really steep region, this is where the equivalence point is, and then it plateaus again. So this is a really important part. We need to analyze what's happening in these different regions, kind of to see what's happening. This first plateau region right here is really important. And if you have a weak acid with a strong base or a weak base with a strong acid, this little region right here is referred to as a buffer region. Now, buffer is something we haven't talked about yet, but buffers are super important. And in biology, maybe, I don't know, every year biology is a little bit different, but buffers are important. Buffers are basically ways to maintain a somewhat stable pH. And buffers uh, are pretty important. So in order to talk about titrations, we need to first talk about buffers so we can understand what's happening in that region. And buffers use something called the common ion effect to figure it out. Now, at the end of the day, a buffer is just a weak acid with its conjugate base or a weak base with its conjugate acid. And because they're weak, they can hang out with each other. Now, you put strong acids and strong bases together, it's like cats and dogs in a bag. That's not going to work, man. They'll start fighting each other. Acids and strong acids and strong bases push to the product side always. But weak acids and weak bases are more chill. They can hang out with each other and kind of coexist. So if you have a weak acid and its conjugate base, i.e. acetic acid and acetate, they will actually prevent pH changes from going off the rails. So it's a really fascinating thing. Um, our blood is a buffer system. Our kidneys have a separate, blood or a separate buffer system. Uh, buffers can be pretty important. So again, in this chapter, with the goal is to find acids and bases, any combination, and start taking care of business. But in order to understand that, we have to first talk about buffers and this common ion effect to see what's happening. Any questions? Okay. Now, common ion effect is basically just Le Chatelier's principle rebranded, in my opinion. However, it is something that's considered its own world. So let's talk about it. So in the last section, we did a lot with the pH of an ammonia solution or a pH of an ammonium solution. But now what we need to do is think about what happens when, what's the pH going to be when both are present, all right? So in this question, the goal eventually here is to find the effect of pH if we add ammonium chloride to 0.25 molar ammonia. Now, ammonia is a weak base, and this is a Kb expression. So ammonia reacts with water, it makes the conjugate acid, and because it's a B base, it's going to make hydroxide. So ammonium plus water makes ammonia plus hydroxide. This question goes a little further, and it says what's going to happen to the pH if you add ammonium chloride to ammonia, all right? Now, earlier we talked about how chloride doesn't affect the pH, but ammonium is common to this equilibrium. Now, based on Le Chatelier's principle, if you start adding ammonium, a product, what's gonna happen to this reaction? Will it go left, right, or stay the same? Left. Left, nice. If you add something, the reaction will shift to the opposite side. So we're adding ammonium to this reaction. Ammonium is a product. Adding something makes it shift to the other side. As it shifts to the left side, hydroxide is used up. Now remember that the all-important Kw from last time, Kw equals hydronium times hydroxide. 
And if your hydroxide goes down, what's going to happen to the hydronium? Wait, say that again. If your hydronium goes down. Totally. So Kw, magic Kw, so important for this section, equals hydronium times hydroxide. At Clifford, the Kw is not going to change. It's a constant, okay? So if we start lowering hydroxide, but Kw has to be the same. What's going to happen to, yeah, it's going to go up, all right? So hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up. You're going to make more hydronium. If you make more hydronium, does that make the pH go down or up? If you make more hydronium, H3O plus, down, right on. So let me go through all this again, because you're probably getting dizzy from me making my hands go back and forth, all right? We had so much ammonium and probably a little bit of ammonium, all right? All of a sudden, we added ammonium, NH4. That makes the ammonia go to the other side. But what's important here is that hydroxide goes down. If you add a product, reaction shifts to the left, less hydroxide, but Hydroxide times hydronium equals Kw, always, for us, all right? So if hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up. You're making more acid. And more acid means the pH goes down. So when they say about common ion, it means you've got some equilibrium, like this one, all right? And all of a sudden, you start adding ammonium, in this case, an ion common to the reaction. Well. Adding anything, well, it pushes to the left. That's fine. But what's important for us, hydroxide is going to go down. And hydroxide times hydronium equals Kw. So hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up. More acid, more acidic, pH goes smaller. That's what common ion is all about. If you can think about it from Le Chatelier's principle. And if you've got Le Chatelier's principle down, common ion pretty chill. Any questions? Okay, so the Shotley's principle predicts that the equilibrium upon adding ammonium, a product, is going to shift to the left. You add a product, reaction shifts to the reactant. Add something to the right, reaction shifts to the left. If it shifts to the left, that means hydroxide concentration goes down. And if hydro hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up because Kw equals hydronium times hydroxide. Hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up. More acid means that pH will go down. All right? It's all, no, it's okay. I, I, I want you to try things. So whoever did that, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up, pH goes down. All right? And at the very end of the day, all right, ammonia is a base. Ammonium is a conjugate acid. Acids make pH go down, all right? So all of this comes together, <laughs> all right? We're adding ammonium. Reaction shifts to the left. Hydroxide goes down. Hydronium goes up. pH goes down. Well, duh, ammonium is an acid. So if nothing else, if you start getting lost in my hand waving, and I totally understand, you just remember that anything with a Ka, or a strong acid for that matter, all of those are going to make your pH go down, all right? That's the name of the game. If you add a base, your pH will go up, because you've got more hydroxide. Okay. So, sodium acetate is added to an acetic acid solution. All right, let's stop right there. Acetic acid, acid, all right? Is acetic acid a weak acid or a strong acid? It's weak, weak, weak. Weak, that's right. It is not HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, or HClO4. Got to be a weak acid, all right? Again, knowing those five acids, pretty important. So this is a weak acid. We're adding sodium acetate. Sodium, pH boring, don't care. Acetate, though, sounds a lot like acetic acid. So if this is a weak acid, what do you think acetate is going to be? Acetic acid. 
weak base. Weak base, that's right. This is the conjugate base of the weak acid, all right? So if you're adding a base and it wants to know about the pH of the solution, do bases make pH go up, down, stay the same? Up, that's right. All bases will make your pH go up. We don't know how much it's gonna go up. Maybe 0 0.0001, maybe four pH units, which would be huge in this world. All right, who cares? Who knows? It just is asking what the effect of the pH is gonna be. So if you add a base, your pH is gonna go up. If you add an acid, like on the last example, your pH is gonna go down. Just realized I didn't turn my thing on, so sorry about that. Questions on that? All right, so at the end of the day, all right, you add an acid, pH goes down. Doesn't matter how much, what kind, your pH is gonna go down. pH will go up if you add a base. Keep that in the back of your mind. Questions? Oh. <clears throat> so, in this problem, let's first figure out what the pH of a 0.25 molar ammonia solution is going to be. Now, this is a weak base. You're going to need a Kb value, and you can look up the Kb value in that chart. But what we should do officially, oh, excuse me, is set up an ice table. We don't put water or solids in, of course, ever in these things, but we do want to put the two ions. So initially, we have 0.25 molar ammonia, and we don't have any of the other. Can't have negative uh, masses down here, so they have to go up by X, and they'll come from the reactant, which will go down by X. So X and X for ammonium and hydroxide, ammonia would be 0.25 minus X. You should then look up the Kb value. That'll Kb will equal products divided by reactants. So in this case, if you look up the ammonia Kb, it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. That equals x times x or x squared. In the bottom, 0.25 minus x. At this point, if you have the solve function or you're really into quadratics, you can absolutely push the solve and figure it out. On the other hand, if 100 times K is less than C, you could pull this little X out. So 100 times this number is roughly 1.8 times 10 to the minus three. This number is 2.5 times 10 to the minus one. So that 100 times K is definitely less than C. So pull out that minus X. Don't use a quadratic here. You're just honestly wasting your time. X, which is hydroxide, square root Kb times Cb. Cb is nothing more than the concentration of your weak base, which here is 0.25. So 0.25 times 1.8 times 10 to the minus five, and then square root the whole thing, 0.0021 moles per liter. That's the concentration of your hydroxide. Minus log hydroxide is pOH 2.67 and 14 equals pH plus pOH. So pH 14 minus pOH is 11.33. And again, at this point, you can make sure that you're on the right target. Uh, this is a base B. So you should have a basic pH 11.33. You bet. Now, we're gonna start doing a lot of this, so I'm gonna keep pushing my little quick and dirty equations. Getting rid of all this stuff, if 100 times K is less than C, 14 plus log square root KB times CB will also give you the same answer. And you don't have to go through ice tables, solving hydroxide, POH, pH, one-stop shopping. Okay. So the 0.25 molar ammonia has a value of 11.33, which makes sense. It's a base, pH should be greater than seven. Any questions? Okay, now, <clears throat> now let's think about what the pH is gonna be when we still have 0.25 molar NH3, but now we're gonna add 0 0.10 molar ammonium chloride, all right? Now, chloride, like sodium, lithium, nitrate, etc., doesn't affect pH. 
but ammonia, as we talked about earlier, will definitely affect pH. If this is a weak base, this is a conjugate acid, all right? So if we're adding an acid to a base, and previously the base had a pH of 11.33, will our answer here be greater than 11.33 or less than 11.33? Less. Good. That's right. We're adding an acid. The pH at the end of the day here will be a number less than 11.33 because acids drop pH. Bases raise pH. Okay. To solve a question like that, <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> you do expect, of course, that the pH will go down. Ammonium is an acid. But we can figure this out. Now, how to do this, if you go back to the ice table, you have initially some ammonium this time. So before it was zero, but now you've got some ammonium, all right? Now, at the end of the day, you cannot have negative any concentration. And then in the way the ice table set up here, zero is the amount of hydroxide. So ammonium and hydroxide are still going to go up by some amount X, and this will go down by X, because when equilibrium, all of these things have to be positive numbers. So if you're ever uncertain, like positives here or positives there, remember you can't have negative X at the bottom. That would mess chemists up. Okay, so like before, this is the Kb expression for ammonia. So like before, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, that Kb, will equal ammonium times hydroxide divided by ammonia. But the difference now is that before we had x times x, or x squared up here, but now we've got 0 0.10 plus x. And in the bottom down here, we have 0.25 minus x. So again, what you could do at this point is get out that lovely solve button. This equals all of this. You have just one variable, blah, blah, blah. However, earlier we took out this minus x. And why we did that is because we said that 100 times k was less than c. And that was valid because the amount that 0.25 went down was so small that it was basically equal to 0.25. And also remember that X is hydroxide. And earlier on, I made a big deal how as you add ammonium, your hydroxide's gonna go down. All right, hydroxide goes down, hydronium goes up, your pH goes down, all that jazz. So adding ammonium will make the X even smaller than it was before. So again, if you don't wanna do the quadratic, and honestly, that's why I recommend, on this crazy problem, you can pull out not just this minus x, but this plus x, because x was even smaller than it was before. x was 0 0.0021 before, and that wasn't big enough to make 0.25 change. Well, x is going to be even smaller now, so minus x will be even less insignificant, and 0.1 is pretty close to 0.25. So basically what I'm saying here is you can pull both minus x and plus x out. So at the end of the day, x hydroxide is Kb times the concentration of the base divided by the concentration of the acid, and you get 4.5 times 10 to the minus 5. So go through all the things again, pOH minus log of hydroxide, you get this, pH 9.65. Sure enough, pH dropped from 11.33 to 9.65. So we said adding an acid should make the pH go down. That's what we're seeing here. This is the common ion of ammonia. Now, if you're sitting back there and going, Russell, come on, you're making already things about minus X, come on, pull out another X just to make your life easier, you egoist, you know, and I understand if you're thinking all that, you are absolutely welcome to go back and push solve button anytime you want, KB equals all this, knock yourself out, <laughs> all right, but I promise, man, if 100 times K is less than C, and it will be for these kind of problems, you can pull out both the plus X and the minus X. So this is an example of a common ion. We realized we added an acid, the pH went down, all right? We pulled out minus x and plus x. You don't believe me? Push it in your calculator. Questions?
All right, we'll do more of this on Wednesday. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, have a great day.